I'm Gary C. Johnson. You've seen these billboards and ads that say size matters. I agree. The size that matters is the size of the results the law firm gets for their clients. We have several multi-million dollar verdicts here in Kentucky. In fact, our firm owns the record for the single largest personal injury verdict in the state of Kentucky. That's the size that matters to you. In Kentucky, give our firm the call. If you're hurt, injured, don't waste time. Gary Johnson drives for every dime. Welcome to Simply the Law of Life, a program created by attorney Gary C. Johnson. Simply the Law of Life provides free legal advice and encourages happiness and quality of life. Now, here's Simply the Law of Life with Gary C. Johnson and Keith Casebolt. Hello, everyone. Welcome into the radio program, Simply the Law of Life. I'm Keith Casebolt, and to talk about those laws and life, my dear friend, Gary C. Johnson. <clears throat> Wonderful to be here, my friend. It is indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, how are you doing out there in the real world? Huh? Oh, we had a beautiful weekend, didn't Hang, we? Hanging in there? <laughs> no complaints unless you were mowing grass and it was a little bit too hot over the weekend. <laughs> Don't complain about the heat. Oh, I'm not complaining about the heat. I'm complaining about the lack of coverage I have on top of my head because I got a little burnt up there. They make hats. I, you know, <laughs> hindsight is twenty twenty. <laughs> you are correct, my friend. <laughs> a good cap would have gone a long way. Well, what's going on out there in the world, Keith? We are learning. We're growing. We're starting over. You know, it was funny. Uh, you you came in this morning, and uh, you and I were talking, and I said I get so discouraged sometimes that. I listen, I read, I study, I enjoy doing this program so good, and then I catch myself failing or falling backwards or battling some of the same old problems, and I get down on myself, and I'm like, why can't you get this right? How come you can't figure this out? Why do you have negative thoughts? And then, as I was telling you this, you said, hey, you're going to battle it the rest of your life. That's just the law of life. Just the thing you just said, mm -hmm. the thoughts that you just said out loud, were all negative. Yeah. <laughs> Not one positive. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I found myself alone for a couple of hours <laughs> going into the weekend, and because there was no one around me, all of a sudden I started, you know, having thoughts that were negative, and I was like, where's the help? Where, where's the people around you? You have to understand, Keith, you're going to have negative thoughts. Everyone's going to have negative thoughts. I was reading some statistics the other day that we have 60,000 thoughts a day. In one day, 60,000 different thoughts, some positive, some negative, some just out and out crazy. 80% of them are negative. <laughs> Boy, you just made me and all of our friends feel good that out of 60,000, 80% of them are going to be negative on a daily basis. Gary, how do we fight that? You don't. You can't, you can't fight it because you have no control over your thoughts. They're random. You don't, you don't ask them to come. Mm -hmm. We think they're us. But they're not. So we think we're in control of these thoughts. But we're not. So we're not conjuring them up. They're just popping in our head. No, I mean, how many of you folks out there has had some thoughts this morning and you ask and brought up and conjured up those thoughts on your own? Or did they just come on their own? Well, how many, how many of us have had a thought that we've said, oh, heavens, that's horrible. <laughs> Why would that have popped into my head? Or I would have never thought that or, or dreamt that up. Well, you may have thought it, but... You... <laughs> yeah. So you had no control over it coming, right? Yeah, the more I get into this, the more I'm convinced that if you can just learn to live with your thoughts and not adopt them and believe them, mm -hmm. you'll be much better off. So in other words... 
you're saying that we should maybe picture like a, a, a TV screen and here are these thoughts on the screen and they're just all going by and we're just watching them. As an observer. And going, boy, that's interesting, or or that one's a pretty mean thought, or that one's a good thought. And if there's a really good one, you might take it. So, <laughs> now, do we have the power to do that? We have the power to say, I like this one, it's good? You have the power to do that, but do you have the discipline to do it? It, take, it takes work to distance yourself from your thoughts. You know... I thought about you over the weekend, uh, the great golfer Phil Mickelson, at age 50, 50 years of age, won a major championship, never been done before. And coming down the stretch, the last four or five holes, he would back off from his shot and close his eyes. And they asked him, what were you doing? And he said, I wasn't seeing the shot that I wanted. The thoughts I were having were negative about the wind, about the water, and I had to step back and start all over again. And I thought, this guy is battling what Gary is talking about on the show, but he has found a way to work with it. Right. He, he made friends with it finally and got it to agree that he was going to make the shot the way he was going to make it. Yeah. So he sat there and said, hey, you're right. We could hook this ball over into the water, but that's not what we want to do. Yeah. So let's back up and look down this uh, angle again and try to hit the ball in the fairway. So he negotiated <laughs> with his thoughts. And I, you know, I'm in more amazement of that than the golf. I'm sitting there watching it mm -hmm. going, this guy is a genius with the way he's handling the mental aspect of the game. I've been reading a a book lately uh, called Can't Stop Thinking by Nancy Collier. Yeah, the title was meant for me. And uh, I picked it up this morning and just randomly opened it up and there's <laughs> something that I think I need to read to my friends. Isn't that thoughts. amazing how that's working for you? Mm -hmm. and, and for our friends just tuning in for the first time, Gary's got these little uh, orange sticky notes, and what he does, he picks up the book, and he just opens it and starts reading wherever he opens it, and nine times out of ten, it's something that either you or I need or one of our friends need. It's always something I need. Very good stuff. This is all the way over on page 76 of the book, this little section on believing thoughts are true. So I'm going to read you what she has to say about it. Real smart woman here. Mm. We stay stuck in thinking because of what we believe about our thoughts. Put simply, we believe them. We think our thoughts are trustworthy and true. By the very fact of their being having appeared, they are deserving of our attention. We mistakenly believe our thoughts matter, regardless of what else we know that might contradict them or make them suspect. With this, this deep reverence for thoughts, it seems unwise to turn away from them. Why should would we reject what we trust most? The mind, maker of thoughts, convinces us that what it's telling us is reality, and consequently that we can't live without its input and without accepting its authority. Thinking is the best thing we're not going we've got going for us or so our thoughts tell us. In propagating this message, the mind cleverly secures itself as a necessary ingredient for our happiness and survival. We keep thinking excessively, not just because we believe our thoughts, but also because we are convinced that thinking is fundamentally good for us. At the same time, we can't stop thinking because we don't realize we're thinking. <laughs> we think without any awareness we're doing it. Thinking is always going on in the background and foreground of our consciousness. It's the soundtrack to our life. To be thinking is to be alive. Thinking feels just like being. We just know that silence and space can even exist between our thoughts, that we can exist in the absence of thinking. Furthermore, we don't know that thoughts can appear and we can choose to decline their invitation, decide not to engage in their content. We don't know what another way of living other than thinking. 
I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah, now let's let's discuss what you just read. So you said a phrase in there, the reverence that we have for thinking. If, uh, if you watch our television program, Simply the Law of Life, there's a little statue there in the bookcase behind us of the thinking man. You know, he's kind of bent over with his hand under his chin. So we say things like, he's a deep thinker, or that person sure does think a lot. We have a reverence for people who think a lot. So now you're telling me that we believe thinking is important. But you started out this show with the fact that we have 60,000 thoughts a day and 80% of them are negative. Which means you're doomed to a whole lot of unhappiness if you can't figure out how to distance yourself from thinking. So the reverence for this thinking and the importance that we put on it 80% of it is going to be to our detriment. That's what this book says. Whew. How's that for a revelation? And she's a renowned psychotherapist, this lady is. <clears throat> it's Nancy Collier. I'll read you what she says about being in love with our thoughts. Mm -hmm. Want to hear it? Please. We don't just trust and believe our thoughts. Truth be told, we are utterly, utterly fascinated with thoughts. We find our own thoughts fascinating, delightful, visionary, and brilliant, and are utterly enamored with the contents of our mind. Our thoughts are what makes us special. The better the thoughts, the better we are as the one who thought them up. The question our thoughts raise are of the utmost importance and value to us and must be answered, each one, with care and attention. When I ask a self-identified thinking addict what she thought would be like to experience more gaps between her thoughts, <clears throat> spend less time thinking, she said it would be like asking her to break up with a great lover. Indeed, many of us experience a kind of love affair with thoughts, attending to and valuing them above everything else in our life. Breaking free from our addiction to thinking would mean breaking up with our greatest love, Demoting our thoughts from our most favorite thing to something not so special, not so interesting, and possibly not even worthy of our attention. Wow. I think that was interesting. So I get that. So this lady who has the problem thinking compares it to breaking up with her greatest lover. So now here we are. You're saying that we are so in love with our thoughts. It's like Facebook. It's like the love of your life. It's become such a part of you that you don't want to give up the thoughts. But yet you're embracing all of them, and 80% of them are going to be negative. It is a... How many years have we talked about the Chatterbox? Oh, 22. <laughs> <laughs> I started doing the radio with you in 1999. Here we are 22 years later. And I'm sure some of the friends are going, Case Bolt, you haven't got it in 22 years? No, I'm trying, but I haven't got it yet. But in the end, that voice inside of our head is the key to our happiness or unhappiness. 100%. I totally agree with that. And you have to figure out how to deal with it. Now, can you give it a name and try to reason with it? Can you distance yourself from it and just observe it, as this lady suggests? Can you not become enamored with your own thoughts and realize they're not you? Mm -hmm. They're just random thoughts coming from your mind. Gary, a friend of ours, you and I both know, um, Bruce, when he, he had a life-threatening illness. And when he got out of the hospital, he told me the grass was greener, the sky was more blue. And he said, I had a smile on my face and I loved everybody and everything. And he said, I made a vow then. I would never, ever get upset again. I would never be bothered by anything again. I was going to live my life in this state of happiness that I was in. And he said about three or four days later, he was talking about problems at the job and he had got aggravated over something going on with the family or whatever. He said, why did I lose that? Why did I fall back into this when I was in this state of happiness 
that was better than anything I'd ever been in. He was talking to his true inner voice at that point. Yeah. So those thoughts keep coming in, even when we think we've got it figured out or, or when we've got it worked out and we know the right decision to make, we still have to battle those negative thoughts. There's two little more sections I, <clears throat> I want to read to my friends upon this book. We've got to, how much time we've got? Uh, we've got another good 10 or 12 minutes. We're good. Okay. Taking ownership of thoughts is this section. It's odd, really, that we refer to the words we hear in our heads as our thoughts, as if they're something we came up with, make happen, and script. And yet the words we hear, the substance of which we're taking credit for or blame for, appear entirely without our consent and without our crafting. Think about it. Would you really choose most of the thoughts that appear in your consciousness? Thoughts appear whether we choose them or not and whether we sanction their appearance. So in what way are they ours? Yes, we are the only ones hearing the thoughts. But we certainly have not scripted them, agreed to them, or invited them into our consciousness. Our thoughts are not ours at all, not something we have chosen to create. Rather, they are random bits of content containing characters, emotions, and situations pulled from our life, popping up out of the soup of our own experiences, usually for no particular reason. Okay, so while you're reading that, I'm thinking all of us have been in a situation before where we're maybe say at a funeral or we're at a place where we're supposed to be quiet or somber. And then all of a sudden, a random thought comes into your head that is Mm -hmm. funny (laughs) that you shouldn't be thinking in the setting that you're in. It just flew in there. You have no control over it. It's just that. That was amazing. Okay. I'm going to read you some more, folks. This is some good stuff, I think. This is little sections maintaining the illusion of control. We stay hooked into our thoughts because thinking gives us a sense of control. It makes us feel like we're doing something for ourselves, working for our own, on our own behalf. Thinking gives us a sense of agency, makes us feel less vulnerable and afraid, less at the mercy of change in what we can't control. We don't know another way, don't know how to let go of what we see as our lifeboat. We are so heavily invested and reliant upon thinking as a way to keep ourselves safe that we don't stop for long enough to get a glimpse of another way, a way of living that doesn't necessitate necessitate constant thinking. We hold the deep conviction that thinking will make whatever we're thinking about better. It's ingrained in us from the time we were born. Thinking is the solution to every problem and non-problem. But what if it's not? What if the premise at the onset of center of everything we believe and do is faulty? What if thinking the way we do it is actually the problem, not the solution? All right, now I've got two things on this chapter you just read. One is if we're walking down a, a dark alley <coughs> and we're by ourselves, we're afraid. But if we're walking down a dark alley and we've got people with us, we're not afraid. So in, con- in conjunction with the thoughts, is the author saying when we have thoughts, we feel comforted that we have someone with us and it brings us that feeling that we're not alone because we're thinking? We think we can think our way out of anything. If we put our mind to it. If we put our mind to mm-hmm. it. Right? Mm-hmm. When the mind says, eh, <laughs> I'm just going to be so negative, you'll never get it done. Okay, so let me ask you the other part that I thought of while you were reading that. We've heard people say about individuals who are happy all the time. Oh, so-and-so, John, he doesn't have a worry in the world or a care in the world. He's just happy-go-lucky. Is that an individual who has stopped thinking at some point in time or can control the thoughts is that the reason that they're happy you can't control the thoughts i believe that so the title of the book can't stop thinking means you really can't stop thinking it means you can't control them from being there is how you deal with them and how you distance yourself from them is the issue Mm -hmm. 
read you one more little section. I hope I got time. You do? The next one is assuming we can control thought. No matter no matter how out of control and random our thoughts may be, still we believe that we should be able to control them and somehow make them reasonable. This belief that our thoughts are thoughts are ours to control contributes to our difficulty in letting them go. We imagine that if we really wanted to, tried hard enough, we would be able to stop unwanted thoughts from happening to control our mind and create a life in which only wanted thoughts appeared. We are convinced that we have to keep fighting with thoughts until they go away <clears throat> and fighting with ourselves for not controlling them better. Ultimately, we can't leave our thoughts alone because we are not responsible for their content and responsible for the fact that they're appearing. So we are thinking that uh, if we get up every day and go to work, we can control that. If we go on a diet and we decide not to eat the dessert, we can control that. If we get up and go exercise, we're controlling that. So we believe if we can control all of those things, we can control the thoughts that are coming into our head. What this whole book is about is teaching us to not become infatuated with our thoughts, understanding they're not us. And you you have to think in order to do anything. Sure. Absolutely. It's those random thoughts that are negative and all those things that come out that she's talking about here. And she says you need to learn to become an observer of those. So, okay, when you give your uh, assignment to your brain and, and you're working on a case and you're, you're like, hey, I need you to figure this out. You're saying the movie is playing, and here comes all these random thoughts in, and, and this thought may be just completely out of the ballpark, and then all of a sudden, the answer will pop up because the brain has been working all this time, but you had to disregard all of these negative thoughts to get to the one you were looking for. You have to observe them. They're going to be there. But you can't adopt them. Once you buy into it, then they will control you. You know, I'm sure right now we've got friends tuning in going, what are you guys talking about? At the beginning of the year, you said the mission is for us to be happier. Chuck. And and <clears throat> what we found out is for us to be happier, we've got to be able to deal with that inner voice, the chatterbox, or whatever you want to call it, and somehow find that peace. We can talk about being positive. We can talk about self-help. Mm -hmm. We can talk about all of these things. They mean nothing if you can't make peace with that voice. Peace with them. Yeah. So do you still believe that the busier the brain is, the more assignments that you give it, the better chance you have of avoiding these negative thoughts? Well, the harder you're working to survive, the less of these thoughts you're going to have because you don't have time. So, uh, artist or whoever, when they say, I was struggling to make it, they were busy trying to reach a goal, therefore they didn't have the time in order to have the negative thoughts, right? Oh, they had the negative thoughts, Keith. 80% are negative. <sighs> <laughs> yeah, it's how you deal with them is the issue. Uh, and it's not easy. But once you start trying to distancing yourself from those negative thoughts, and really just don't pay attention to them. Don't adopt them as, as you. Yeah. Then it makes a big difference. So basically, you're going to watch it as if though it's a television show, and you're going to be standing back looking and going, boy, that's interesting, mm -hmm. but it doesn't make sense for me. Interesting thought you got there, but it's not me. Back to the golfer, Phil. Hey, we sure could hit the ball in the water, but that's not what I want to do. I want to hit the ball over here to the left side. Mm -hmm. That's right. The book is Can't Stop Thinking. And out of everything that you just said and everything that you talked about on this program, the stat that stands out to me, 60,000 thoughts a day, and out of the 60,000, 
80% will be negative. Five to one ratio. We got our work cut out for us. You can catch Gary's television show Tuesday nights on WYMT, your CBS affiliate, at 7 p.m. A late night replay is in Central Kentucky on WKYT, your CBS affiliate. If you start the week early or start the weekend early, you can catch us on your Fox affiliate at 6.30 a.m. If you would like to make a comment or talk with Gary, you can reach him at gary at garycjohnson.com. You know, I know the book is Can't Stop Thinking, but you just gave us a whole lot to think about. <laughs> so it's going to be a busy week. Remember, we said that years ago, we said, okay, we're just wanting you to be able to think, folks. That's what the whole program is about. Yeah. Now I'm not so sure. Now, now we're wanting you to be able to stop thinking. Yeah. On behalf of Gary C. Johnson, I'm Keith Casebolt. Thank you so much for taking this time to tune in. As always, Gary and I look forward to seeing you again next week, right here at this same time. Thank you for listening to Simply the Law of Life, a program created by attorney Gary C. Johnson. Until next week, may you be safe, blessed, and happy. If you're hurt, injured, don't waste time. Gary Johnson cries for every dime. I'm Gary C. Johnson. You've seen these billboards and ads that say size matters. I agree. The size that matters is the size of the results the law firm gets for their clients. We have several multi-million dollar verdicts here in Kentucky. In fact, our firm owns the record for the single largest personal injury verdict in the state of Kentucky. That's the size that matters to you. In Kentucky, give our firm the call.